Hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us. I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest, and I've written a few books. One of those books is In the House of Tom Bombadil. I've been a professor of philosophy, and I've been a commercial real estate investor. But enough about me. Why don't we kick it over to you, Tom, and then we'll have you, Glenn, take it from there, introduce yourself, and get us into the topic of the day. I'm Tom Price. I teach uh, Christian thought, uh, systematic theology, Christian ethics, philosophy, and other things at a host of places, uh, one of which is Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. And I'm Glenn Sunshine. Um, I'm a retired history professor, which means I've also taught a whole bunch of different things, ranging from uh, military history, economic history, war um, and society, uh, witches, werewolves, and vampires. Um, <laughs> I've done a bunch of different classes. But uh, currently, I am a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and my main job is as a ministry associate with Reflections Ministries in Atlanta. Great. Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about is an article, which we'll link in the, um, in the show notes, uh, time, called Time to Return to Medieval Courtesy Books. Okay. Now, a courtesy book is just what it sounds like. It's a book that teaches you proper behavior, manners, uh, etiquette, those kinds of things. But th it, they extended beyond that, and there was actually a, a deeper purpose behind them. They were written for children, uh, and the idea was that you wanted to inculcate virtue in the child, get the child to begin developing virtue young before they had a chance to develop vice. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So that, that's the whole goal of them. And they were written in very simple language and things like that. Um, now, the reason for the article, let me just read a couple of, of, of paragraphs from the beginning here. To the woke crowd, teaching civility and manners favors artificial concepts that reinforce power structures and control behavior. This Marxist perspective reduces everything to the class struggle terms of oppressor and oppressed. For this reason, manners must be eradicated and never taught to vulnerable children. So many things today reflect this anti-manners mentality. This trend can be seen in brutal and obscene speech or texting, it is found in ugly, dirty, and torn clothing. Coddled children absorb this lack of manners from uncouth adults who fail to impose rules lest they hurt feelings. Indeed, in the Marxist worldview, Western civilization is the culprit for manners and all things racist, colonialist, and evil. Hence, children must be protected from courtesy and manners that transmit this civilization's artificial and hateful values to future generations. Now, this is um, this is an interesting assessment of, of the current state of the culture when it comes to manners, and I'm not sure I would have thought about it in quite these terms, but it makes perfect sense, especially if you look at behavior of people online. Sure. Yeah. Um, and and the utter the utter lack of manners, the utter lack of any sense of appropriate behavior in, in a whole range of settings is really pretty stunning. I've had students deliberately pick up newspapers and start reading them during my lecture, back in the days when there were actually newspapers. <laughs> um, I, I've had students put their heads down and go to sleep in class. Yeah. Now, Granted, uh, given some of my lectures, that may be understandable, <laughs> but but still, at least you should fake it. Right. Um, you know, my, my mother taught me before I went to college, she said the most important thing I can teach you is how to sleep in class without the professor noticing. <laughs> um, and there's a technique. You know, so, but, but, but this sort of blatant disrespect for other people the level of rudeness in interactions and things like that, I think is, is at a point where it's getting genuinely pathological. You know, and I think... And the point of the article is we need to start thinking about returning to these kinds of courtesy books to not only to just simply avoid that, but, to all, but also because th these are acts of vice. Right. And what we should be doing is promote virtue. Yeah, I think, I think Glenn, that uh, it, as we've talked about before in other settings, it, betrays a kind of uh, 
a naive and romantic view of human nature that has its roots in a sort of uh, b conviction or belief that the, whatever is spontaneous and wells up from, from within is is innocent and, and even uh, good. But the other thing I think about is, I mean, it, does this person, you know, do, do these people who promote this way of thinking actually, you know, have to deal with the consequences at all? I think that anybody who deals with, ch you know, children um, with large groups knows that there's a, a decorum that's called for if you're going to actually get anything done, if, any, if there's going to be any learning that goes on. Um, and so it, it just strikes me as uh, something that uh, is, is self-evident. I mean, we, we need to have these things. Even, even people who are predisposed to a, you know, a sort of a, a, a liberal progressivist outlook. I remember years ago, I had a conversation with a relative of mine who was the dean at the University of Miami. And in the course of our conversation, I talked about the fact that one of the problems that with, say, you know, social welfare programs is that they, is they don't encourage gratitude. They more or less encourage entitlement. And he actually agreed with me, even though we are politically about as far apart as you could be and still be Americans. <laughs> he agreed <laughs> that um, there ought to be some sense of gratitude uh, for anyone who receives anything good, including people on welfare or pu public assistance. Anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm not as sure that it's as self-evident as you, you think it is. Uh, Lynn was a preschool teacher for years, and she told me any number of times that the kids really, in a lot of the families, the kids controlled the family. Yeah. You know, the parents would do what the kids want. They would align with the kids uh, even when they knew better. And Lynn said, I don't know how many times she said to me, you know, I've got these parents. I just want to take them aside and say, look, you are the mother. <laughs> yeah. You get to make these decisions. Yeah. You get you act, act like a parent. Right. You're not yeah. your child's friend. You're not your child's buddy. Act like a parent. Yeah, I think that and, that says something about you know, the we, lack of... We are not raising kids that way. Well, I think it says something, too, about the... I, maybe a couple of things. One is the level of self-regard that even these parents have. Maybe they don't even uh, kind of think of themselves in, in the way that would be required in order to enforce that kind of uh, demonstration of respect and... Um, you know, that would also require compliance and so forth. Maybe, maybe those folks just uh, lack any way of sort of framing that or understanding that in a way that's healthful. Uh, but the other thing is maybe, maybe a lot of these folks just don't have the practical wherewithal to actually pull it off. <laughs> you know, when I'm, I'm talking, so, you know, the, the art of projecting authority is an art, um, I, I, you know, you know, as a, as a, you know, I'm at a stage now where I've got grandchildren, but when I was younger, I, I had to project authority. Uh, when it came to my kids, I was a youth pastor. I had to project authority in that setting. It, it, it became pretty, pretty much second nature to me. And I could turn it on almost on a, on an instant, you know, it was a snap of the fingers. Yeah. It's interesting. The Greek word for authority, exousios, looks to me, I haven't really checked this out, but it looks to me like the roots mean out of being. Yeah. Out of, out of, basically, it's, it's something that comes out of what you are. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. That, that sounds and right. that's the kind of thing that you're talking about. Right. And, and the, the art of projecting authority is, is something that I think um, is developed. It doesn't necessarily just come naturally, but then it can become a second nature. Yeah. Yeah, Tom. And, and I think one of the things I think the medievals kind of had their hands on that we don't is it, they did have a sense for for kind of what things are, natures, <laughs> um, human nature, parental, what being a parent is, what having ch children is all about. Not saying they had, they knew everything, but they had those things in place where cultivation um, of, of children um, had had a form, had a shape, and had a direction. Um, it wasn't just about, you know, kind of making them consumers or making them, um, you know, decide certain things to their own selfish gratification, um, but it was about uh, choosing the good, making the soul, crafting the soul, 
and and there it was holistic and and so you th- that balancing of authority and the nature of parents and parental authority um was tied to this whole you know intelligible order part of which the 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 shaping forming and directing children um was at the heart right interestingly enough the article points out i i, I have to get this in they do point to rousseau <laughs> as one of the roots of this um but they say that you know rousseau and others look to the middle ages for their model of how things should be untrammeled by the evil effects of civilization. <laughs> um, they've got this sort of romanticized notion that in the Middle Ages, things were, well, quote, more tribal, natural, and spontaneous. And pre-modern children were noble little savages who ran about wildly without supervision. <laughs> Ribald scenes of medieval revelry and feasting are the revolutionary ideal. The problem is this has nothing to do with the way the Middle Ages really was. <laughs> <laughs> and that... The, and then the article moves on to talk about, you know, what what Middle Ages and what childhood in the Middle Ages actually uh, looked like. Well, let's jump into that because I think that would be uh, worthwhile uh, to to explore that the very subject that we're, we're you know of childhood in the Middle Ages. What was it like? Yeah. Well, one thing that that it's important to remember is that. Although they did recognize childhood as a distinct phase of life, um, children weren't seen in the same way they are today. Uh, There are a number of reasons for this. First of all, um, infant mortality was very, very high. And as a kind of self-defense, it seems parents didn't regularly attach themselves too closely to their children for a while. Um, In areas where the Roman Empire had extended, wet nursing was really common among people who could afford it. So you would send your child out to a wet nurse uh, for nursing until they were weaned. That raises a whole host of other issues as well. But what it means in practice is the child is not typically home, not with the parents. So we're talking about a particular social class, though. Yeah, the people who had enough money to do that. Fostering was extremely common among most social classes so that when a kid hit anywhere from six to eight, roughly on the average, they were sent to live, sent off to live with someone else to train them in whatever it is they were going to do. If it's going to be a knight, we call that a page. If it's a craft, we call it an apprenticeship. Again, it depends. A peasant wouldn't do that. But the other classes, this is really very typical. Now, the reason that that fostering was done, by the way, wasn't because they didn't value the children. It's because, in principle, a parent, they expected that a parent would not be hard enough on the child hmm. to really train them the way they need to. They'd be, they'd be too soft in terms hmm. of their training. And as a result, the child would not learn effectively, which can kill you if you happen to be a knight. Yeah, this reminds me of something about Montaigne. Uh, uh, wrote in his essays uh, along this very line um, on uh, tutors. So he was, he was an advocate of uh, bringing a tutor into the home of, uh, you know, so we're talking about the aristocracy here in France. Uh, rather than uh, relying on mother or even blood relations uh, to mm-hmm. educate the child for the very thing, for the very reason you point out there, uh, that it, this, that this not going to be demanding enough. You got to have some some distance. Yeah, yeah, and and this again goes against some of the the stereotypes of the Middle Ages, where the parents were just really unconcerned about their children. The very practice of fostering, which seems so bizarre to us in many ways, really pointed out the fact that they were concerned for the child's welfare, and therefore they sent them to someone else to raise because they knew they wouldn't be tough enough on them. This also brings up the, the experience of C.S. Lewis. If you may recall from Surprised by Joy, he talks about the great knock. Uh, right. And, you know, he, so this uh, austere kind of, uh, I guess, apostate uh, Presbyterian, uh, you know, who was just rigorous and demanding, uh, Lewis uh, remembered with great affection 
Um, yeah. But at the same time, he he knew uh, he couldn't uh, just uh, you know slide by that guy. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Um, now the article, you know, the article doesn't get into those aspects of child rearing, but it does talk about how children were taught virtue very young and were expected to behave in certain ways from a very young age. So they recognized childhood as a distinct phase of life, but they did not have low expectations. They expected the child to behave. They expected the child to understand what was expected of them. They expected the child to act in a way that's far more mature, frankly, than, than we do. And once again, we're in a situation where I think our culture tends to lower expectations for actually well past childhood in terms of, of what we see, um, it, it, what, what our ideas are about what children are capable of doing. Well, this is another interesting, uh, I guess, uh, contradiction. Uh, we have some... Um, pockets in our culture where we see an extreme emphasis on achievement where you know you have to get into the best preschool <laughs> you know think about it, you know the, there are there are there are parents who are like are traumatized because their child didn't get into <laughs> the right preschool <laughs> and it just like it just never seems to let up in a certain segment of our society but in other in other places in our society it's just chaos yeah, but but even with the best preschool, you got to be careful there because what are the preschools teaching? What are the schools teaching? Yeah, I would argue that what you see there is once again a continuation in of low expectations. You know, when we were in Germany, while my kids were in elementary school, we kept up with their schoolwork in the space of one to two hours a week, hmm. compared to how many hours are they going to spend a day in class at home? You know, there, there is a reason. Now, part of it is, is, you know, we're dealing with wealthier classes, of course. But, you know, when you look at our founding fathers, when you look at people from that era or earlier, you will find that many of them are essentially fluent in Latin, Greek, and French, yeah. Yeah. maybe Italian, by the time they're 10 years old. Yeah. Yeah, we just, you know, at the at the Academy of Philosophy and Letters uh, this past week, we had um, Joy Piper from Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary as one of the presenters. And, he, you know, he, he was uh, describing uh, the nature of the curriculum at, at Greenville Seminary and the problem that they face. And that is, you know, they're attempting to um, kind of revive a classical uh, approach to ministerial training that assumes uh, that you have had a classical education. And what right. they've discovered is that, no, they have to do a lot of remedial work. Yeah. Uh, so they started, they started, they added, they added an additional year of preparatory work uh, to address all the things, or many of the things, probably not all, but many of the things that they couldn't take for granted, that maybe, you know, people like Edwards and others in the past uh, could, you know, be, have, we could have taken for granted with, with regard to them coming to school. Yeah. yeah, Calvin Seminary used to have a very rigorous kind of curriculum that way as well. Um, but I, I don't know what their current state is. I haven't really paid attention to what's going on in Calvin. I, I remember but, um, I remember that yeah. uh, John, John Gerstner, uh, years ago, the historian, I think he taught at Pittsburgh Xenia, well, a Sp Sproul's mentor. I remember mm -hmm. him telling uh, a story about yep. the way in which he would give Jonathan Edwards sermons to his class and and, so, and then his uh, his philosophical work on freedom of the will and he was talking about then how graduates could barely handle what would have been very commonplace knowledge in terms of dealing with philosophy that uh, Edwards could take for granted and now they and and you see, I see this especially in theological work where the metaphysical and ontological assumptions which aren't easy you know, to, to get a handle on, I, I grant it, but they're so necessary. Otherwise you are so 
oh, wide open to just fill it with any kind of flood of of uh, of interpretation, and and so I think these things are back before us. We're recognizing we're kind of in a, a bad place, and these these sorts of things they could take for granted um, are, are things that that we're having to catch up on. Yeah. Well, mo- moving moving. Away, I mean, I think this is this is important important ideas, and it parallels very much the kinds of things that the article is actually talking about. This is really sort of a different question. Hmm. But the degeneration, I I would put it into a a broad category of the lessening and degeneration of our expectations of children. Right. And, uh, you know, so let's go back to the idea of the courtesy books. Uh, The article argues that there are two sources to the, the... courtesy books. The first of them actually is the idea of chivalry. Mm -hmm. Now, chivalry itself is is a rather broad concept, and there's a lot going on here. Um, Its roots are found partly in Eleanor of Aquitaine's court and the courtly love tradition in in southern France, uh, but also there's a very heavy influence in the church. And in the ideals of chivalry, the knight is supposed to protect the weak, um, not um, uh, not treat them badly, not treat them even rudely. They're supposed to treat them with honor and respect. Now, whether or not this actually ends up happening a lot, this is the ideal that is being promoted. And uh, part of the reason for this, like I said, it's the influence of the church, it's the influence of Eleanor's court, But part of the reason for this, uh, to quote uh, my friend Anton, uh, an armed society is a polite society. (laughs) When you are dealing with people who are armed, the warrior class, people who are trained at arms, you don't you, you want to behave courteously. You want to behave with manners and things like that, because if somebody gets upset, it could result in a fight that could kill people. Right. So the net result, you have this elaborate system of of etiquette and proper behavior that's developed basically uh, on the one hand within the warrior class itself to keep them from killing each other. But then the church says, wait a minute, this needs to be extended, especially to the poor and weak in society. Let's stop and reflect on this a little bit here, Glenn, because this is, I think, a really valuable uh, thing to apply to. Um, you know, our world today, particularly those places in which we uh, see the greatest, uh, you know, amount of violence, you know, places like inner city, lower class, underclass, you know, environments. You know, in any given, you know, week in the city of Chicago, more people are killed than are killed in a mass shooting in a place like Texas, you know, in the course of a year. Um, But it doesn't make the news because it's, but if, and if we did that, it, this reminds me. I had an, I had this wild experience. I went down to Philadelphia years ago with a bunch of fr- bunch of friends. We we were da- we were going down there for a business meeting at the Pew Charitable Trust, and we stayed in a, a nunnery. These were uh, uh, Episcopal uh, or Anglican, I suppose you could you'd say, uh, nuns. So they weren't Roman Catholics, and uh, so it was surreal because of these you know very, I guess you could say. Uh, you know, um, circumspect, uh, polite nuns said, oh, we've got to watch the news. Um, we want to see how many murders occurred today in Philadelphia. <laughs> and so we sat down and, you know, we watched television. It was the most depressing uh, thing because it was one shooting after another for a solid half hour uh, interrupted by the sports report and the weather report. And, <laughs> and that was the entire news broadcast. And, I, and we were all from Boston. We were just stunned, you know, looking at each other. And the, the nuns were, com- were were completely, you know, nonplussed. They just got up and folded up their chairs and went away. But but getting to this, this matter of, uh, you know, what we often see happen in these environments is uh, a breach of a kind of un- scripted or unspoken or unrecorded etiquette, he disrespected me, is something that will be said. 
mm. and that leads to violence. So the, the 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 sort of the code of chivalry, in terms of an honor code or a code that is enforced to belay violence, is something we really need to see imposed in uh, these environments that supposedly we need to liberate and just sort of get away from so that people can behave naturally and uh, presumably peaceably. But that's Oddly okay. enough, I think if you look at the old line mafioso, you see that. Yeah. If you are not doing any kind of business with them, they leave you alone. Right. Yeah. You know, there will be the occasional collateral damage if a store owner who they are trying to do business with refuses. They might blow the store up <laughs> and somebody, you know, a bystander might be killed. But that's not the kind of thing that they that they would typically do. Mm -hmm. um, my wife, again, Lynn, was a nurse in, at a hospital where there was a very significant presence of the family in the area. And she tells a story about one day there was a patient and they said, you know, at the end of the hall. And when she came in, she was told, OK, there's this patient at the end of the hall. She has her own nurse, so we don't need to do anything for her. You know, just go in every now and then and see if they need anything. And the next, you know, she was an overnight nurse in the morning at 6 a.m., a bunch of guys in immaculate three piece suits show up with baskets of, of fruit and chocolate and flowers and things like that for the nurses to say thank you for taking care of mama. Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're, they're, the, the code within the mafia is tra traditionally you, you don't, you know, if, if someone's not involved, they're not involved and you treat, you treat them right. You treat them with respect. If they're helping you out, if they're taking care of mama, you take care of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't see that as much with the kinds of street gangs we've got now who really don't seem to care about collateral damage. Yeah. That is why the code of chivalry was so important. Right. Yeah. So uh, why don't we get into a little bit then? So what, what were some of the things that were that they, well, they tried to to, to help uh, kids do or learn? One, one other route, by the way, and yeah. that's the monasteries. OK, hmm. because the monasteries, when they take children in as novices, they had to teach them proper behavior. So they note um, Hugh of St. Victor, who's a very well-known yeah. medieval um, thinker and writer uh, from Paris, wrote De Institutione Novicorum, which is a book on how teaching novices how to behave. It covers dressing, speaking, eating, how to behave, and all of these things in a good Christian manner, in the, the holiest possible way. And so you get the books of, of, of chivalry and you have these books for monasticism, both of which end up working together to produce the first courtesy books, which are written in Latin and therefore for the upper classes, but they're rapidly translated. And courtesy books are going to continue to be produced throughout the Middle Ages into the Renaissance in the early modern period. You're going to continue to get these things. And the goal of all of them, this is the key point, the goal of all of them is to get kids young and start teaching them to live according to virtue rather than vice. Yeah, so it's it's about more than just simply making sure the social machinery is greased. It's about right. the, the development of the child and uh, presumably the child's uh, eternal welfare. Uh, and uh, sort of, uh, well, I guess a blessedness and happiness. Right. Um, so uh, they give a, a specific example. This is from actually one written in Middle English. The article provides a link where you can get this in Google Books. Okay. Yes. So if you want to try your hand at Middle English, um, <laughs> yeah. let me give you a couple of hints here. First of all, U and V are interchangeable, <laughs> and I and J are interchangeable. Yeah. 
So if you keep that in mind, you can actually read these things. It helps to read them out loud because if you do them out loud phonetically, you'll understand it. It'll sound like you've got sort of a weird Scottish accent, but it'll work. Yeah, I, I started so to read you, through if it. If you want to check it out in the article, there's a link. Yeah, I read yeah, through it. It, it. One of the things they were talking about it, that I could make sense of was the way in which they were telling you to clean your fingernails and just how to do it and how significant it was in public to have your nails cleaned. So it really, really was it was pretty thorough in, in the things it was getting into. Yeah. So um, let me give um, let me read you a couple of paragraphs from the article where they give you some specific examples. The morning preparation is clear. Quote, when you awake in the morning, attend first to your prayers, then comb your hair, clean your ears, clean your face, and purge your nose of the vile matter inside. <laughs> so make yourself presentable after you pray. <laughs> Next, outside the house, the child is expected to impress others. Next quote. When you leave the house, do so with a pleasant expression on your face. Speak nicely to any you see and walk slowly and demurely. Don't run off and throw stones or sticks or wrestle with dogs. <laughs> walk along quietly and politely so that all who see you say, there passes a good child. <laughs> it's, it's amusing to me that they had to note you shouldn't wrestle with dogs. Wrestle with the dogs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, one more. Uh, at the table, the instructions were straightforward. Quote, share your delicacies with your fellow diners so as to be seen as kind and generous, and don't complain if your serving is small. Don't chew on bones because that is what dogs do. Instead, use your knife and cut off the meat. Don't chew with your mouth open. <laughs> Some of these are still words of advice we, we use. Sure. Um, especially the don't chew with your mouth open. Right. Okay. So now this may not look on the surface like it's dealing with virtue. But the books are plain that they really see this in terms of virtue. So why is that? I think the answer is, you know, when we think of manners or we think of courtesy, uh, you know, we think of, of etiquette. You know, yeah. when, when, when you pick up your glass of mead, have your pinky extended, you know, but, but that's not really what it's about. Uh, what it's about is your manners are the way you treat other people. And therefore, they have to do ultimately with how you think of other people. So you act in a way that is polite, that is courteous. You act respectful. You don't chew with your mouth open. You don't cause a commotion running and throwing sticks and stones and wrestling with dogs because that just gets the dog worked up. Um, you speak nicely to others. You smile. Um, you make yourself look presentable. You don't, uh, you don't go out all disheveled because what that communicates is you really don't care about other people or what they think of you. You know, what this brings to mind, Glenn, is uh, a couple of things. One is um, often you'll have people associate manners with uh, a kind of superficial surface presentation yeah. um, and fail to see that this is a means by which we express our regard and our uh, our desire to be pl pleasing to other people. Um, right. The other thing is, is it fails to account for the way that, you know, our behavior can actually work back into our outlook and even into our dispositions and, and shape and form us. And where I've seen this happen most, I think, uh, I guess, dramatically or in a pronounced way is with young men who go into the Marine Corps or into uh, some other f very demanding, they, they actually learn to see, they actually uh, often go in very uh, rough around the edges, so to speak. And uh, it's the uniform, it's the, the manner in which they're really, uh, you know, forced to pay respect to the authorities that they have to deal with that actually really produces a genuine transformation. It's not a superficial yeah. thing at all. Yeah. 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 Um, 
where where I you know I, again I don't think we I don't think we appreciate as much the degree to which manners behavior how we present ourselves and things like that how much that really says about our regard for other people yeah well i think the marine corps uh, i'm with you the marine corps does a great job at this um because they teach them (laughs) boy do they teach them respect yeah yeah that then carries over to how they deal with other people Yeah, Tom, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. Yeah, was, no, I was, I was related to this. I mean, I think in an everyday kind of place, I see issues um, that are the consequence of, of losing a grip on some of this is in driving behavior. Um, it, it, I mean, it's always kind yeah. of driven, driven me a little nuts, uh, you know, the, the lack of civility, the aggressiveness. I, you know, I, I went for a full year to pick up and drop my, my, uh, my youngest off at a Christian school. But the Christian parents were just as self-centered and uh, lack of concern for anyone else getting in and out of that parking lot. And that, that spills over. Um, I remember uh, growing up in the South where we still kind of had a little bit of that, uh, the old, the old uh, culture in place where you, if you let someone out in front of you, you waved and appreciated it, right? Or you didn't get right up on the back of somebody and run them off the road if you're in a rush. You, you kind of respected the other person, but somehow you put a shell around it and all of a sudden it's similar to the, you know, the, the internet, I think. One, once you don't have to have a, a kind of, a relation to someone, you can begin to act in ways you normally wouldn't. And then that spills over into your normal reactions. Um, just look at any kind of long line in a grocery store, or anything else now, um, a radical impatience, um, and sometimes just an absolute rudeness that uh, is coupled with these things. And I've for a long time thought writing a book on the, the ethics of the roadways <laughs> to kind of regather some of this in places where we may not think about it, but they really do tell us a lot about ourselves as a culture. Now, did, 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 did these parents have uh, bumper st- stickers that said, uh, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven, or did they have like a, <laughs> a, a you know? It, it, I, I've often wondered: is this is this meant to be like uh, you, you put the bumper sticker "Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven" on your on your bumper, just so that you can, you know, have a pass when you actually, you know, pass someone rudely on the road, <laughs> and, yeah, and yell at them. Yeah. <laughs> now, one of, one of the things that is is interesting to pull this out of the Middle Ages and into the 18th and 19th century, William Wilberforce, I didn't look up the date, but on one date, uh, he wrote into his journal, God has set before me two great ob- objects, the abolition of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. Hmm. Okay. Now, we know Wilberforce, of course, from the abolition of the slave trade and then ultimately the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. But the Reformation of Manners seems like an odd thing to put in there Hmm. until you realize what manners mean. Manners have to do with how you regard yourself and others, ultimately. That is exhibited in your behavior. What you do reflects more of what you think than what you say or than what you say does. Or better yet, if you really want to know what you believe in your heart of hearts, look at what you do, not what you think you believe. Okay, so Wilberforce, by going after the Reformation of Manners, this is directly connected to the abolition of the slave trade because we needed to see slaves as human beings made in the image of God who have been unjustly uh, enslaved, have had their liberty taken from them. So Wilberforce got involved in something like 60 different charitable organizations, philanthropic organizations. He's one of the founders of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. But he's involved in ending child labor. He's involved in 
reforming uh, the rotten borough system in parliament, you know, which basically allowed people to buy seats in parliament. Uh, he's involved in the Sunday school movement to provide education for the poor. He's involved in working, well, one quarter of the women in London when he started were prostitutes. He's working on reforming that. Uh, he's working on all kinds of different things because he understood the connection between these the the kinds of of rude and behavior, the mistreatment of animals, all of these things. He saw the connection between that and actually slavery and all the other vices. He saw them as all interconnected. So he mm. believed that if he could help reform the manners of the British populace, it would be an essential component that would help him in his quest to end slavery. And in fact, Wilberforce and his companions, it's not a one-man job here, uh, Wilberforce and his group were so successful that it was said of him that he made goodness fashionable. <laughs> it leads to a complete transformation of English society. Hmm. Yeah, and, and when we, when, manners are important. Yeah, when we think about these things, it's easy for us to sort of, I guess, uh, because we're trying to avoid falling off the road into one ditch, uh, assume that we've fallen off the road into the other ditch just by the fact that we've changed some things. So what, I guess what I'm getting at is um, let's think a little bit about um, – how people dress, um, you really do see, um, you know, I think some well-intentioned people, maybe back in the 60s, particularly with, the, uh, you know, the counterculture and trying to reach, uh, you know, kids who are part of that, downplaying the importance of, you know, dressing up for church uh, because they want to make some uh, gesture that's intended to uh, say to these these young people who have dropped out, whatever, uh, you know, God loves you and wants to, uh, you know, uh, forgive you of your sins, etc. So now that uh, kind of um, exception to the rule uh, has now become the rule. Yeah. And but you know, the thing I've observed is that we're really not very. Um, consistent with this. And, and what I mean by that is, I remember years ago, uh, I had some people in a church that I served who were very casual in terms of their attire when it came to church. But then I, I, I ran into them at some event uh, that was sponsored <laughs> by an employer, and they were dressed yeah. impeccably. And I thought to myself at that moment, okay, I get it. Um, it's not that, you know, uh, you... Uh, are unwilling to show your regard through your attire. It's just that uh, you don't apply that to church, you know, and consequently, does that maybe spill over into other ways you think about the nature of worship and so forth? Uh, do they have a kind of Rousseauian uh, outlook when it comes to the nature of worship? I, I think that a lot of evangelicals do. They, they really, you know, uh, they may think Rousseau is horrible when it comes to uh, the, the effect of his thinking on, say, education. But in terms of their approach to worship and how they conduct themselves in church, they are the children of Rousseau in yeah. a church environment, if you get my drift. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, th th this is good. That's our second reference to Rousseau in the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and one of the, I think one of the things you can you can see there with, you know, a, a great point to the way in which sort of, especially in the U.S. and, and it, it has spread out the, the the kind of the moving away from some kind of formality um, to the very casual, to, um, to moving away from you know as you, you know. Um, theologians to emphasize kind of the transcendence, the holiness, the, 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 those aspects that are unfamiliar and it has shifted to the very familiar, so familiar that Jesus, I've heard people literally come out before their sermons and when they pray, they're just like, you know, Hey God, it, it's that kind of, it, it's, it's, you know, the great buddy in, in, you know, 
that's here to basically uh, uh, project our egos or whatever. Um, and then you see this strong pro-me emphasis, you know, for-me emphasis, which was a good thing when the Reformation retrieved it to include us and show that it gets all the way down into me as a person. But the problem is become isolated from everything else, and it has all become pro-me and for-me and about-me. Um, and that, I think, will explain, you know, the, re the rest of the dispositions of, of just, yeah, being lazy or just being so casual that it's like going to the beach when you go to church, you know. Um, and I, I know that with like uh, my wife's family's from uh, live in Colombia and even there every day at the house, they get up and they dress up. It's not just about putting the sweats on and the, and the you know, the T-shirt all day. They respect each other enough to get not, you know, they're not all wearing suit and ties, but they are making an effort to consider the other. And and I think there is something to it for for our own um, habits of, of grace and formation that we are orienting ourselves beyond the the least common denominator. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that. It, you know, the idea that wearing torn jeans and a T-shirt and stuff like that uh, is, you know, just being casual and just being me and all of that kind of thing. Number one, it's a uniform. <laughs> um, you know, you, you you wear torn jeans because they're in style yeah. and other people are wearing torn jeans and so on. Yeah. Uh, so you're not really expressing your individuality. That's there. right. That's right. But along with that. <laughs> Along with that, I would argue that dressing in a, you know, in, in a sloppy manner, you know, and I'll just use that word for lack of a better one right now. Um, it, I think ultimately it also has, a, it, it reflects on how you think about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. If you know. And and I think it actually re lower whether you're aware of it or not. I think it gives you permission to be sloppy in other areas, mm. and particularly with how you treat other people. Isn't this one of the things that uh, Jordan Peterson uh, stresses with uh, young men who just can't seem to get their act together? You know, mm. do certain things. Uh, you know, stand up straight, make your bed. <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> One of the things, you know, it's fun to fun to see. It. You've you've probably seen these um, films uh, from like the you know nineteen tens uh, of just street life in places like yeah. San Francisco or New York yeah. or Paris. Mm -hmm. What's remarkable, and I think everyone uh, is impressed by this, is everybody appears to be uh, dressed for you know. Uh, success, so to speak, yeah. you know, even the workmen appear to be, have a different kind of uh, yeah. uh, attire than you, you think of workmen today wearing. And everybody's thinner. I mean, it's yeah. very yeah. Uh, uh, hard to, to find overweight people in these in these films. I was in the airport just the other day. I do a lot of flying uh, and uh, I was looking around. And I was like, Everybody is overweight. I mean, everyone <laughs> appears to be overweight. Now, that's, that 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 wasn't true. I mean, there were people who were in good shape, et cetera. But but maybe one of the reasons why I felt like everybody was overweight is everybody was dressed very sloppily. You know, everybody was you know traveling in their sweatpants, and and I and I get it. You know, it's it's uncomfortable to to you know uh, get in and off of airplanes and that kind of stuff. But we all know. Uh, I I mean, I was a kid in the '60s and '70s. People even as recently as that would dress up to fly. You know, they'd wear their best clothes yeah. Yeah. Uh, because you know it was a big event to get on a plane and fly to some place. Uh, you know, new or exciting. And uh, but there are so many ways that the slovenly uh, approach to life uh, has kind of bled into everything uh, yeah. that I think has had a lot of. Uh, you know, unintended or ancillary effects, uh, secondary effects that people didn't expect it to, there these things to. But anyway, uh, back to you, Glenn. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think, though, that that is actually a really important point because where we started off 
uh, when we were looking at some of the the rules that that came up in the Middle Ages is you dress, you dress appropriately. Um, now, in the Middle Ages, that meant you dressed according to your station and things like that. There was a much more hierarchical notion of that. And there were rules on what you could and could not wear, depending on your social class and so on. But again, I think that there is this sharp tendency, you know, when you dress, you know, this is just something that that the Dress for Success movement taught people. When you dress sharply, it affects how you present yourself. It present it affects how you think about yourself. It affects what you do and how you do it. You know, what's also intriguing about this and paradoxical in a way is that even in our uh, casual attire, there is a kind of hierarchy uh, when it comes to brands and uh, types mm-hmm. of uh, you know clothing that people have. And there's a very uh, astute, I think, uh, sort of, uh, well, uh, awareness of, okay, this person is wearing that brand of shoe. That means this person is a certain social class. Even though it is ostensibly as casual as this other guy over here with the bargain brand (laughs) sneakers. But the people in the know, Know that those sneakers that the this other guy is wearing are a thousand dollars, and the sneakers this guy you know got at Walmart is twenty five bucks. Everybody knows this, so the, even though we tried to get away from social hierarchies and all that kind of stuff, social hierarchies form. They're just r- yeah. a reality, and people are always looking for ways to distinguish themselves, uh, and in some sense uh, demonstrate their worth, and. I guess then the question is, is, well, if that's the way it is, maybe the best way to handle it is just be honest about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And maybe and maybe uh, what our elites need to do is kind of uh, get back to being elites in a self-conscious way that um, keeps the rest of the society in view, if you know what I mean. Well, th- but think about it. They already do that. Have you ever seen a member of Congress, a, a male member of Congress, who is not in a suit or a senator or a lawyer while they're on the job, at least? Yeah. You know, uh, doctors have their uniforms. You know, they're, they're, we, we do this already. But somehow at the level of popular culture, you know, we can say that, yeah, we expect our doctors, our lawyers, our, our politicians and so on to be in suits. But we don't need to do that because we are not them. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? We're not elite like them. We are just common folk who can wear their, our torn blue jeans and T-shirts why should we not be wearing at least business casual? I say as I'm sitting here in a T-shirt, okay, <laughs> granted. But, but I'm also in my dining room, okay? Yeah. Um, but but you, the, the, the hierarchy is there, yes, on sort of a pop culture level, but it's also there more broadly culturally. The people that we look to as leaders for leadership and all that sort of thing, a high high power businessmen, they're typically in suits unless they're in Silicon Valley. Yeah, one of the Bankers, things that you know, all of, of the these thing, people we expect them to wear it. Yeah, one of the things I remember distinctly about um, the difference between doing going to university here in the states versus when I went over and was in the doctoral program in Oxford is the way in which in Oxford we had a lot of formals regularly, weekly, where you had to wear the appropriate attire, which was uh, all, you know, always usually a tuxedo with your, your, your cap and, and, and your cape. Um, and you wore this, the formal, you did, if you didn't wear that, you were not eating there. Um, you wouldn't be going to eat there if you wore jeans or or something less than that and you also had to have the cape and there would be people for who would forget them they would have to borrow one 
Um, and this, I think, was is part of that that cultivating, um, uh, uh, you know, that is going deeper than being superficial. And c- contrast that with some of the college students I get now, where they just come to class in their pajamas. Um, you know, there's no effort. I mean, again, we didn't have to wear. Well, if you had your tutorial as an undergrad, you had to still wear your formal attire. That changes in seminar and, and things like that in Oxford. But here, there, there's no real expectation, uh, maybe other than, you know, the equivalent of like a prom. Yeah, yeah at the Academy of Philosophy Letters, where I was, uh, you know, just uh, uh, at here a couple of weeks ago, uh, this, the dress code is um, suit and tie for men, for everything. Mm-hmm. And you just, I think you just, you know, nobody had a problem with it. You just make it clear this is what's expected, and if you don't, you suddenly feel very self-conscious. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I was told that the uniform at the Evangelical Theological Society is khaki pants and a blue blazer. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you got the khaki pants and the blue blazer. I guess not. The, I guess the tie isn't required, though. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure about that. I haven't been to ETS in decades, literally. <laughs> right, right. Uh, from what I've seen, you're not missing much. <laughs> no. So, um, I, you know, I, I guess, you know, we, we've kind of, as usual, we've sort of morphed this into a variety of different directions. But I, I think the thing that intrigued me most about the article is, well, first of all, it just really highlighted the fact that we just simply have no clue about courtesy anymore. Um, But along with that, it raises a whole host of other observations that go along with this, like dress, like um, behavior in your automobile, like, um, you know, uh, etiquette, even at meals, things like that. All of which I think reflects a significant worldview issue having to do with how we understand anthropology, how we understand what it means to be human, uh, what it means to be ourselves, first of all, and the kind of uh, respect that we should have for ourselves and how we present ourselves, but also the respect that we have for other people or the lack thereof which I think is abundantly demonstrated uh, everywhere we go. You know, people will tell you uh, that, um, you know, people would never behave live the way they do on the Internet because the Internet is sufficiently anonymous. If you do it live, somebody might punch you right. or worse. You know, the, I, I, don't think, I don't think that matters because the way you behave online ultimately reflects what you really think about the people around you. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that that came to mind as we were wrapping up here is how this is a social project and how in our world today, particularly those folks out there who have small children uh, who want to develop the kind of respect that children should have for adults and people in authority, how that's undermined sometimes by the very people that you're trying to get your children to regard and esteem. For example, when when my children were small, we we instructed them to only speak of you know or address the, address uh, adults by Mister or Mrs or Ms or whatever uh, whatever was right and appropriate, and then the person's last name. And it was not uncommon for people to say, "Oh, Mister Smith is my father." Just call me Jim, you know, that kind of thing. And I would have to talk to those guys and say, well, I I want you to understand here, you're not just Jim to my son. You're Mr. Smith, and there's a reason for that. And and I need you to help me out here, or we're just not going to be able to spend any time with you anymore. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that, that kind of thing, you know, and then, you know, 99 percent of the time they, they they got it and they went along with it and they were OK with it. But the immediate or the initial response was to get casual. Yeah, you know, that uh, that's typically American. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that uh, one of the. One of the uh, takeaways of this, you know, the, the weird thing is, 
I think that this was driven home to me when I was a kid reading Mad Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> they had a thing on, on endangered species. And one of the endangered species was the polite kid. <laughs> who addressed adults as sir and ma'am. <laughs> right. um, and it was replaced by the, by the brat, you know. And, and, and you know, to this, I, I read that and I thought, you know, I want to be the polite kid. And to this day, I still address people using sir or ma'am. Well, this is interesting because I think that most people would have a, 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 an image of Mad Magazine as being something that uh, promotes rudeness, uh, and, not not uh, respectful and, regard for elders. And yet, oddly, someone actually wrote a book on this where yeah. they were talking about how Mad Magazine really does teach this kind of thing. Mad Magazine protested it. The guy responded hey, look, all I'm trying to d say is you guys are really bad at what you're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So, but, uh, but oddly enough, that, that you know, in, in, I still remember reading that. I must have been maybe 10 years old. Yeah. Well, and they it may, has stuck with me all these years. It may have been tongue-in-cheek for them, but it's sort of like Looney Tunes and the, the symphony. You know, mm -hmm. most... The people, you know, in the past, you know, or at least from our era, uh, learned about, you know, uh, you know, Beethoven and Mozart and, and they wouldn't know the names, but they would know the tunes or this or the, the the movements of the of these things because they were in the cartoons. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 You, you forgot Rocky and Bullwinkle. They need to be in there, too. Right. 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 <laughs> well, we should probably wrap this thing up now. Um, is there anything you want to add here as we close here, Tom? Um, I think the last thing just was on Glenn's point. I think we see this also in in the way we, especially as Americans, relate to titles. Um, I know when I finished my doctoral work, it was very hard for me as an American to get people, even in you know students and stuff, to call me Doctor Price. Of course, with friends and colleagues, it's different. They're friends and colleagues. You don't go by that. But I'll I'll never forget uh, Doctor Reinhard Hutter um, at Duke, who was German, and when when he um, was being addressed. He wanted to be addressed by the degree he earned, and he he understood this very significantly. Um, is you know in the academic setting naturally, and and you know in professional settings, um, and so for for. For me, that kind of always felt a little weird, but I, I really see what's going on here is a very different ordering of culture and respecting of certain things. And, and I think this gets very flattened in, in our American experience, and it makes it something even odd. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, you know, yeah. I, I just I, I think the same, uh, and I'm just wrap you know my thought up with your thought there, Tom. I think that. Uh, so many of the things that we regard as artificial are intended to create a kind of second nature and become kind of natural in their own way. Yeah. But a layer of, a, you know, sort of acquired um, behavior on top of the spontaneous. And it's yeah. intended to direct the spontaneous in healthful ways yeah. and to suppress the things that are not healthful that do spontaneously come up. Uh, anyway, we'll give you the last word here, Glenn. What, any thoughts you want to? Yeah, leave just us a with? quick thing on titles. Um, when I was in Germany uh, on a faculty exchange program, one of the professors told me that he only uses all of his titles, Herr Professor, Doctor, when he needed to get a plumber. <laughs> it caused him to jump to the top of the line. Nice, <laughs> nice. Um, you know, and at, at the moment, if I were going to use all my titles, it would be Hair Reverend Professor Dr. Sunshine. There you um, go, man. You, you, I, you're loaded. You're I, loaded. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use that with a plumber over here. <laughs> um, however, um, I think, the, I, I, you know, I'm one of these people who grew up in the 60s and 70s. I've got an allergy to titles. Sure. You know, and this is this is one of the things that is a hang up I've got. Right. Um, I, I actually tried to encourage my students initially to use my first name, and none of them wanted to because they wanted to maintain the distance. Interesting. So eventually, I just got over that. That's but, good. Yeah. But that's another dimension of the uh, of the discussion that that we could probably spend a whole episode on. 
Right, uh, right. But since we're already over time, we won't do that now. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Well, to that point, we thank you for listening to the Theology Podcast. You've made it to the end of another episode. And uh, we're grateful to all the folks who support us. Send us, uh, you know, their well wishes. We get emails all the time from people in different places. Uh, sometimes people ask us questions. Sometimes they just cheer us on, and we're glad for that. We're also glad for the financial support that people provide. That's a very important matter, particularly when it comes to paying uh, for the services that we, you know, that we need to, to use in order to make the show available to you. So thank you for your support in, in that res- in that respect. Anyway, I think that's enough for now. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye now.